I can still remember that really magical day. That was November 15, 2012. It was 6 p.m. Um, I was in front of my laptop nursing a two-month-old heartbreak. I was stalking my ex on Facebook. <laughs> At the same time, I was watching a television, and suddenly there's this TV commercial from AXN that says that there's now an application opening for The Apprentice Asia. At that very moment, I you know, conjured so many memories of my college life being such a big fan of the show. And I knew that I had to cross out this opportunity for my bucket list before I die. So fast forward later on, after 30,000 applicants have been submitted video-wise to AXN, 30,000 trimmed down to 100, 100 trimmed down to 30, and finally the 30 trimmed down to the final 12 who would make it to the TV show, some of which wanted to become celebrities. I flew to Kuala Lumpur, brought my Barong Tagalog with me, thinking if I get into the final two, I would wear it. And I also brought with me my Filipino flag pin, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen, I've always consistently worn on the boardroom. But I won't talk about much about what happened in the show. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen the episodes. And if not, I don't know how you would understand the rest of my speech. But nevertheless, you can just go online because there are creative ways of watching the episodes online, <laughs> which I will not endorse you guys to do. Just saying. What I will be sharing are some unsolicited advice of what exactly were my learnings and lifelong lessons of what I've learned being part of that show, shooting it last February to April in a span of two months. And believe me, if someone asks me if I would do it again, I wouldn't. It's the most cancer stressing, inducing activity that I've done in my life. And if you have a friend who you want to you know, submit into vengeance, the coldest vengeance ever, send them to Apprentice Asia and you will get the best vengeance ever. It was a very stressful activity because we had to wake up every day at 5 a.m., sleep at 11 p.m., pit out your ego with other 11 contestants, egos of which you know, can rival the rest of everyone's ego maybe in this room. And it was very such a struggle because every day of your life, you would want to cling on wanting to be the lone survivor and you know, be told off by Mr. Tony Fernandez that you are hired. And the first thing I would like to share as a lesson is why rely on this character, which is my favorite word, when you can prepare for it. And a lot of Filipinos are always known for it. When I ask a lot of my foreigner friends what do they think is an uh, English counterpart of the word this character, I found it out from a one good friend and he said, we always say it in a way that we wing it. And I hate it every, every time someone says, just wing it, because it's a disrespect and insult that things can be solved even if you don't prepare for it. And today's generations and times have forgotten the idea that when opportunity meets preparation, it is actually equals to luck. And most people always do not give in to preparation because they always think, and as most UP students, for example, would think, that I don't need to prepare for exams because it's going to be stock knowledge anyway for me to be able to ace it. But one thing I would like to share as a lesson is that before I joined Apprentice Asia, you have no idea how I've been such a big fan of the show. You guys are familiar with Apprentice US? Yes. Apprentice UK? Yes. Apprentice Spain? Italy? Czech Republic? Ireland? Australia? Slovenia? <laughs> Russia? You guys name it, I've seen all 158 episodes of The Apprentice since I was in college. And I told myself, if I've seen 158 episodes, I cannot lose this competition, <laughs> right? And then at that very moment... But more than that, the more important value of preparation is that I always believe that preparation breeds familiarity, and familiarity breeds confidence. And when you're confident, you're unstoppable. Because if you look, for example, at all the franchises of Apprentice, the first episode was always about selling something, based on which country was it selling. For example, in Ireland, they sold apples. In Apprentice US, they sold lemonade. And I was very sure that they were going to sell something in the first episode also of Apprentice Asia. I thought it was dim sum or noodles, but we ended up selling fish. Nevertheless, that kind of preparation allowed me to mentally and psychologically prepare myself that I'm this unstoppable force representing the Philippines to become the best in Asia. 
But more than that, I'll be honest, because I never knew who Tony Fernandez was. In fact, Air Asia only came here in the Philippines just last year. So I told myself I had to know who was the man I was going to work for. And lo and behold, I found myself watching all 34 videos of him on YouTube. Research that, I tell you it's 34. <laughs> and what I did was I pulled out my Excel sheet, tried to find out what were the common things between me and Tony. And lo and behold, again, I found out that he mentioned the word, for example, passion, averagely three to four times in one interview. He mentioned the word leadership averagely six to seven times in an interview. And he mentioned the word people or people management averagely two to three times in an interview as well. That kind of mental preparation allowed me to surface out the things I wanted Tony to know. Because only Tony can find out who you are in the boardroom. And that for me is the power of preparation. Because even if I didn't know that I was going to be part of The Apprentice, after watching all those episodes, when luck came in that the apprentice applications went in for Asia, I grabbed it. And that was my golden virtue at the end of the day. The second thing I would like to share is that it's not about working hard, I realized, in the apprentice Asia, but working smart. And a lot of Asians are so, so guilty of this. What is working hard and not smart? Working hard is taking pride of going to NBI office or to the immigration office at 4 a.m. with your sleeping mat with you, taking pride of having, you know, taken the queue for four hours just to get your passport or NBI, and only to realize later on that there's actually an online application to do that for five minutes. <laughs> working hard and not working smart is going from point A to point B of EDSA, and taking you know, pride that you've gone 30 or one hour to traverse the entire thing when you could have downloaded Waze, for example, in your applications in a smartphone like iPhone or Android. That is, working, that is working hard and not working smart. And I hate it when I have a lot of colleagues, for example, who go to the office at 7 a.m. and go home at 12 midnight only to find out the next day that the kind of output they yielded is not something worthy of burning the midnight oil. And one thing I would like to share with working hard and working smart as an example in the Apprentice Asia was my trusty iron steamer. <laughs> You'll never know why I was working smart and working hard for me. Because just to give an example, you only see 5% of what really happens behind the camera. The rest are edited for your own entertainment and pleasure. And one of the things I hated about the show is that there was only one iron board and one iron in a house of 12. You can only imagine how at 5 a.m., everyone scrambles to get that iron, to get his own suit or dress creased out, and one of us even had to hide every night that iron under her bed so that she'll be able to iron it for the first time when she wakes up. It was a different issue for me because I had my own iron steamer. And every time we go on the set, when there was an issue about the camera and the lights, and everyone was waiting for one hour to be told what to do next, if you wanted to look for Jonathan at that very moment, he was busy steam ironing all his clothes away. That for me was working smart and working hard because it was important for me every six or seven in the morning to not scramble and cram of finding the iron out, but rather sticking it out in the kitchen countertop, sipping my hot mug of coffee, and strategizing during my own zen how to kick out Andrea or Alex <laughs> in the competition. That for me was working smart and not hard. The third thing I would like to raise is please do keep on developing your strengths because there's no point as you grow older to correct your own weaknesses. And I can easily see in the eyes of everyone in this room, there are so many type A personalities <laughs> who I'm sure have this intuition that if you want to become the best of your life, for example, you need to correct your weaknesses and forget about your strengths because you're strong anyway in all these things. Our parents or my mom would tell me if I'm good in English or literature, forget about, for example, that one and work instead on your math. And my belief is that this is wrong because the older you get, there is a lesser chance for you to correct those things because that exactly is who you are as a human being. And that's exactly what makes you as an imperfect person trying to live out this life. And my issue is, rather focus on your strengths because there's a high probability and an infinitesimal chance that that strength will overwhelm whatever weakness you have at the end of the day. And I would like to share an example of this in The Apprentice Asia. 
This is episode one, and I'm sure a lot of you know that this was the, the task of selling fish. I love cooking, I love buying fish in the market, but I'm really poor in selling. Not just fish, but everything else. So the moment I found out that we were going to be selling fish, I was like, whatever bleated, you know, word that I can say in my mouth. And I told myself I could not sell fish, and the cameraman cannot expose me that I don't know how to sell fish. I was in danger of getting kicked out at the very first episode. But lo and behold, again, I realized that while we were all selling fishes, none of the guys were good in numbers, and no one even bothered holding the calculator to compute what should be the proper price on what to sell with the fishes. I grabbed that chance because I knew as a marketer for the past seven years of my life that that was my strength. And I took it. I hid behind the counters selling fish, but my job was the most critical because it was all about pricing at the end of the day. My strength helped me and covered me up whatever weakness that I had. And this is not to say that you don't need to do something about your weakness. You can work on them gently and slowly. But I'm telling you, if you want the best rewards out of everything you want in your life, work on your strengths. Because at the end of the day, they will overwhelm whatever weakness that you have. And the last thing that I would like to share, and this is my favorite one which I'm most passionate about, is that the unexplainable secret to success is out there. And it's called grit. And what is grit? Grit is passion and perseverance combined over a period of years, not weeks, not days, but sticking it out that if you wanted to build your own restaurant, if you wanted to have your own family, if you want to become an engineer or doctor, you stick it out for the next 10 or 20 years. And you have this unwavering faith that whatever happens as an obstacle in your life, you're going to get through. And that exactly for me was my lesson in the Apprentice Asia. Because if you look at my statistics, for example, and this is the final three of The Apprentice. This is Andrea and Alex. I knew by the second episode, and this was a picture we took by the second episode, that the three of us were going to make it to the final three. And in fact, I thought it was going to be Alex and me in the final two instead. But one thing I was most insecure about this young lady was that statistically speaking, she was the better candidate. She only had one loss. She had six wins. And even at the moment that you know, she was the project manager of her own team, she won it. I only had four wins, I had four losses, and even at the moment that I was a project manager, I lost it because of that Mediterranean pizza. <laughs> but here's the thing, because I knew I was the one who had the grit, and I knew I was the one who wanted the most out of winning the competition. And I told Mr. Tony Fernandez, I didn't really know what Angela wanted in this competition. Did she want to get out of law school? Or did she simply get a high out of winning the competition? And I told him that for someone who loved marketing, for someone who's seen all 158 episodes of The Apprentice, there couldn't be any way that you cannot choose someone like me to win the competition. And that was great. But more than that, and there's a picture of me and my brother. Just to get an idea, and I've told this many times in my media interviews, my family came from humble beginnings, and we didn't really have much since I was in grade school. To my parents, for us to become first honors, to become scholars in our high schools and grade schools, always incentivize us and bring us to Shakey's or to Jollibee every quarter. And that was enough for us. But that kind of insecurity fueled me because I was so sick and tired thinking, why is it the only rich classmates of mine in my high school were the ones who were able to get good grades? And why is it in this country, most of the time, People who had the best education because they went to expensive schools were the ones who were able to make it big in their own right. That insecurity formed my grit, and that allowed me to want it to prove that in the apprentice Asia, you can never be too small to dream big. But more than that, I'd like to share one example of one of my favorite movies of all time. And this 1997 film, Gataka, starting, um, starring Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman. It was about a movie wherein there were two kinds of people, the invalids and the children of God. The children of God were perfect human beings who were able to send themselves into outer space to build a new colony because they were all perfect and good-looking. The invalids, on the other hand, had to be here on Earth, remain silent and become janitors and waiters. But Vincent, the protagonist, proved 
that he can fool the system and he made it big and he even went out of the system to become a part of a new colony. And that itself is grit because they proved at the end of the day that neither it was high IQ, neither was it, you know, coming from a family of being able to send it to expensive education, and neither is it being good looking. That's why I won the Apprentice Asia, by the way. <laughs> and neither is it because you were in good physical shape, for example, for you to become successful in life. Empirically speaking, when they made scientific studies about this, they found out that the most successful people in life were the ones who had grit. And that grit for me was sourced for my insecurity of coming from humble beginnings. That grit for me was sourced of wanting that person who broke my heart last year to finally see me on TV <laughs> to the tune of Adele saying, you could have had it all and you lost it. And lastly, because I only have three minutes, that grit was sourced from being sick and tired that the Filipino is always bullied in Southeast Asia. That a lot of people didn't think that we are the best out there when it comes to marketing and sales. One of my contestants told me in the task wherein we did hospitality in a hotel, how it was so ironic that a Filipino was the one who was the project manager in both sides. And I told them, you know, if you bark a Filipino, he just wouldn't bite you. He would eat you up alive. <laughs> and I told her that after I won the show. And lo and behold, that exactly is the kind of pride that I wanted to prove to the rest of the world. Because there's nothing wrong if you just send blue-collar workers abroad. I don't see that there's anything wrong with that. But there is something wrong if everyone thinks that the limitation of Filipinos is to just send blue and not white as well. Because I think we can do both at the same time. And I think that's the reason why a lot of the investors and a lot of Filipinos right now are getting that stage for the rest of the world. So that's it. That's what's stepping between the two of you right now, between you and me. It's about sourcing out your grit. And unfortunately, I cannot find that grit for you. You have to look it by your own and by your own self. It may be your dog. It may be your girlfriend. It may be you looking through Flipboard or going through Facebook day in and day out. But that's your responsibility. Because without grit, you wouldn't even have an objective in life. And that is what life is all about. Besides eating and drinking, you need to get out of boredom. And grit, for me, is what will fuel you for the rest of your lives. Thank you at mabuhay po kayong lahat.